feel for you, Carl, when the, when the slide isn't what it's supposed to be. Carl does a great job. All our guys do a great job. We really appreciate it. You don't realize until you lead singing everything that's going into it. I'm not just getting the song on key and everything else, but you've got books and slides and who knows what else. But uh, they do a great job. And I was, it sort of reminded me when I watched you with that this morning, um, the first time I saw, how many of you remember a movie called The Three Amigos? First time I saw The Three Amigos, uh, I think it was a college date with Tracy. Was it college or was it after we were married? Anyway, years ago. And uh, we went in and uh, the first 15 or 20 minutes of the movie was great. And then it got very confusing. We could, didn't, the, the timing didn't follow, you know, in, in the movie. And, and then about three quarters of the way, something happened in the movie that obviously should have happened earlier. And here, at that time at least, I don't know how they, they do uh, movies now, but at that time there was like four canisters of film that had to be put in one, two, three, four order, and it was put in one, three, two, four order. <laughs> that night, about three-fourths of the way through, everybody said, they got the canisters out of order. And it was a full house, and people are like, we want our money back. And so it can happen, you know, even in Hollywood. We did not get our money back. We didn't even get a free ticket to the next one. But uh, then we, and in those days you couldn't go home and watch it on Hulu or whatever and, and see it. So it took a long time to figure out how that movie went. We're glad you're here. I did want to mention this morning um, because we often are blessed with new faces. We love our old faces, but we often have new faces. There are these cards in the back of the seats um, on either end of the row. Um, if you're new here and would fill out one of these connection cards, that will help us in thanking you for being here. And uh, if you're one of the old faces and you have new information, an address or phone number or whatever, um, you can always make that adjustment on this and leave it in the seat or put it in the collection box or hand it to one of us. Just helps us be organized. Uh, thank you for cooperating with those things. We're glad you're here, whoever you are. As anybody who has ever tried to, tried to uh, raise children or teach students or coach a sports team or anything like that knows really hard to motivate a person to action simply through commands or threats. It just doesn't work, at least long term. There has to be more than just commands or threats. Maybe as you grew up, you were motivated to get that yard mowed or, or that room cleaned by the promise you were given, uh, some reward later, a soft drink perhaps, or ice cream, or, or something like that. Sometimes promises, nice promises, can motivate us pretty well. Well, several years ago, Trace and I did some traveling on the West Coast and uh, up in the Seattle area and really enjoyed our time there. In fact, uh, while we were there, we were we said, you know, we could live here. We really loved the area and the climate and everything. And then we got to thinking about how we would be disowned by family and so forth. And so that idea faded. But we, we loved it out there. Uh, we were doing some work with a congregation north of Seattle. And while we were there, we met some interesting people. And there's one in particular I want to share with you this morning, a brother in Christ. His name was Alan. Alan... Uh, Grew up in a different world, probably, than most of us, and not just because it was on the left coast. He grew up in pretty rough circumstances, in a tough world, and he became a tough guy. 
Uh, he spent quite a bit of time in the West Coast motorcycle gang culture. And as you can imagine, he had seen most everything and done most everything. But today he's your brother in Christ. In fact, he has been an elder in the Lord's church in his mature years. And he has a wonderful family full of servants of Jesus. And he and his wife have, have served the church. And they've been foster parents and adoptive parents and really influenced scores of people for the Lord down through the years, this former biker. Well, how did it happen? Well, it, it wasn't because Alan was commanded to do anything. As you can imagine, he didn't respond well to commands in the life he lived. And you didn't threaten him. If you listen to him, talk about how it happened, he will explain the change that occurred in his life by referring primarily to one verse of scripture. And it's the one that I want us to meditate on this morning. It's 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1. So Paul wrote this to the Corinthian church, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1. He, he said, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Now that is a verse worth not only thinking about, but memorizing. And so let's do both this morning. If you're a student of the New Testament and and have read First and Second Corinthians through the years, you know that Paul, who was the writer, had, let's say, a challenging relationship with this church in Corinth. He wrote them at least four letters, two of which we have um, in the New Testament. And he made multiple visits to this city, at least a few. And some of those visits were not pleasant encounters between him and the church. And, and I bring that up just briefly today because I want you to see how this fits together in its context. So as an example, if you look at chapter 6, 2 Corinthians, and just listen to these words he wrote to them, beginning at verse 11, he says, We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own, afflict, own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. Well, it sounds like there's some tension there, doesn't it? I mean, if I categorized all of you as children today, we might not have a pleasant visit. And that's how Paul described them. Uh, this was a church, Corinth, that, that had a lot of problems, a lot of struggles, a lot of challenges. And Paul is concerned with them because one thing is they just struggled to behave themselves. Now, it's not like they didn't uh, believe anything. I mean, they... They, they like some things about being a Christian. They like some things about their faith. It seems like Corinth loved to assemble and, and, and they loved to do some spiritual things, but man, the way they behaved at times must have made some, like the apostle, question how deeply they were committed to Jesus. And then if you look ahead, just a bit in chapter 7. Again, just another sample of this. Verse 2, beginning. Paul writes, Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I am acting with great boldness towards you. 
I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort. In all our affliction, I am overflowing with joy. Again, you can hear a part of that at least. There's some tension. Here was a church that is seeming to struggle with accepting the authority of this apostle, this, this man Paul who was writing to them. They're struggling with submitting to his teaching. And uh, in fact, they had rejected him in some ways. They had accused him of doing wrong to them. And Paul uses this second letter to try and restore things with the Corinthian church. So in between these two passages that we've sampled is where our verse for this morning is. Chapter 7, verse 1. There's actually a section that runs from chapter 6, verse 14 through chapter 7, verse 1. And there's some other uh, phrases in that section that you might be more familiar with. Uh, where Paul writes things like this. He, he writes, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. You heard that before? And then he, he asks the question, what fellowship has light with darkness? What portion has a believer with an unbeliever? And then he says, for we are the temple of the living God. Well, those are pretty famous verses of Scripture often quoted. They're all right here in this same context. And those verses a lot of times are pulled out and quoted out of context, and sometimes damage is done by that to the Word of God. Let's try and keep it together here in context so we can understand as we should. Paul wants the Corinthians to behave. That's the simplest way of saying it. To behave, to behave like Christians, to live in a certain way, to not live like the world they're surrounded by. And so that's probably going to mean that they're going to have to get rid of some friends, that they're going to have to quit going certain places that they frequented and start going some other places. They're going to have to give up some bad habits that they used to indulge in. And there are no two ways about it. They're going to have to do this in order to be who God has called them to be. So that's the situation Paul faces with the Corinthians. They need to be obedient. Paul is an inspired apostle. They need to submit to what he is saying to them, submit to his teaching. They have to change. And so I suppose that, that Paul could have approached the situation and just issued commands and, and, and made threats. Uh, but that's not all he does. Uh, in fact, going back to this verse, I want us to really get in our heart today. Chapter 7, verse 1. Listen to again the way he says, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. How does Paul appeal to them to behave? He wants them to behave. How does he appeal to them to behave? He bases it on promises. Since we have these promises, he writes. What promises, we might ask? Well, the most immediate promises that he's talked about are back in verses 16, 17, and 18 of chapter 6. If you just look at that, and start, there's some promises there. Paul there recalled how God had promised to be their God. And he had promised to dwell amongst them and to walk amongst them. You see, the Corinthians, these believers in this ancient city, were now actually the temple of God. God dwelt amongst them. 
just like he does amongst us. They were the temple of God now. There was no permanent structure someplace anymore where you could go to find God, to be in the presence of God. That is no longer the case in, in the New Testament. We are the temple of the living God. Verse 16. That's a wonderful promise. God promised them that they would be his people. Verse 16. And that he would be their father. Verse 18. And they would be his sons and daughters. Those are great promises, are they not? The supreme being in the universe has called us into his family. He wants us to be his sons and daughters. He wants to live amongst us and walk amongst us and work through us. He wants to be as close to us as a loving father. Those are incredible promises. And I, I certainly hope they're not too old and and too familiar to not be inspiring to us, even this morning. These precious promises of God, they certainly weren't for my friend Alan, who I described a few minutes ago. He said that those promises inspired him to change his life to exchange bad friends for good, to abandon bad habits and replace them with spiritual disciplines, to stop going some places and start going others. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Do you need an infusion of that in, in your life today? Of that idea? I'm telling you that a, a, a simple fear of hell won't do it. That is not sufficient. Keeping some rules and regulations will not do it. It takes more. It takes some hope. It takes banking on the promises of God. You know, maybe we need to refresh ourselves with a study and a reminder of the great promises of God if we're struggling with our behavior. If we're struggling to live the way we are called to live, it is time to remember the promises of God. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. God wants to be your God, your Father. He wants to live with you in a close, loving relationship. He wants you to be his son or his daughter. He wants to welcome you to an eternal home. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. When you and I became Christians, when we were washed in the blood of Jesus, in the waters of baptism, we were washed clean. Our sins were wiped away. We were really and truly forgiven. Just like these Corinthians that, that Paul was writing to here, just like they had once done, you see. 
But you know, in another sense, becoming holy and, and set apart to God is also a lifelong process. It is uh, something that we take an active role in. The process of becoming more and more like God. Fancy word is sanctification, being made holy. And so even after we come to Christ, even after we obey the gospel, we have some decisions to make, don't we? We sometimes have to take decisive personal action. We sometimes have to step up and change the way we think and act. The Bible calls that repentance. We have to perhaps get rid of some things that are making us dirty. Things that are making us unholy. We have to rid ourselves sometimes of bad influences that we have allowed in. We might, even after we come to Christ, decide we have to stop going some places. We have to stop doing some things. We have to become what we are. It's another way of describing repentance. Become what you are. We are Christians. That means like Christ. Sometimes we have to decide to become that. A cleansed people. A holy people. Not because we've been commanded or threatened, but since we have these promises. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for just the power and simplicity of your word. In every verse, there are such riches for us. And help us not to just be satisfied with sort of an academic approach to Scripture. To say, oh, I understand that verse. But to, to see how transformative it can be. How it can change the way we will live tomorrow and the next day. Thank you for your love in Christ. For all your great promises. And how they can change the way we think and act. Pray your blessings on each person that's assembled to honor your name today. Wherever they are in their spiritual walk, we ask you to bless them, give them courage to be who they are or to become who you've called them to be. Thank you for hearing us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning as we conclude, we're going to sing a song of encouragement. Hopefully through these words you'll think about what we've seen in God's word. And if you need to make a public response of some sort today to uh, call on prayers of the church or, or to obey the gospel of Jesus, uh, we'd love to see that. If there's any way we can help you, please let us know while we stand, while we sing.